legumes in tropical grasses, are they a help or are they a hindrance? <laughs> Just an interesting question to keep in the back of your mind as we think about how the legumes work in a tropical pasture sward. What I want to try and achieve this morning is to communicate with you guys where we've been, what we've found, what we're currently working on um, in regard legumes in tropical pastures. I hope that that generates some thinking in your minds, uh, maybe crystallise some thoughts, share those with us as well. But hopefully also what we work through maybe triggers some thoughts for where we need to go in future. So broadly, in the outline of this presentation, I'll work through the context of what this nitrogen fixation story is about uh, in the context of a grazing system. I'll run, go through a very quick rundown of probably 15 years worth of work uh, pretty quickly in terms of what we've done for legumes in tropical pastures. And then the last part of the presentation is about well, what we're working on just now. So I sort of felt it was important to go back to establish the context and the ground rules of what we're trying to work with here in regard legumes in tropical pastures. We're on the northwest slopes, that's what I'm talking about, that's where our work is based. So we're in this summer dominant yet variable rainfall environment, let's call it an average of 650 millimetres of rain. We know that our tropicals grow anywhere from October through to May, so it's a nice long growing season. We know that with nitrogen in the system, as Sue showed in her presentation, they can be both persistent and productive. So these are all good things. Um, our prior work has shown that a minimum application of 50 to 100 units of N per year is sort of the base level to maintain that productivity. And that leads us to the question, what do we do? Do we fertilise the N or do we fix the N? What's easiest? To put into context the magnitude of nitrogen that we're talking about, I just built this little table to, to tease it out. So on the left hand side, just a range of crude, crude proteins and each column working through how many kilograms of crude protein in a tonne, how many kilograms of nitrogen in a tonne, how many kilograms of N in five tonne, and how many kilograms of N in ten tonne. Now, the purpose of this is just to illustrate the magnitudes of N that we have to deal with in order to achieve a certain target. So for example, 8% crude protein, bottom of the barrel, five tonne of mat dry matter, we're looking at 56 kilograms of N required to grow to be in that five tonne. If we want to grow 10 tonne of dry matter at 8%, well, we need to get 113 units of N from somewhere. Alternatively, if we grow five tonne of material, but at 14% crude protein, it's the same sort of order of magnitude of nitrogen required. So you guys are agronomists, you probably know more about this than I do, but I thought that was a useful, ex useful illustration just for the magnitudes of N that we're chasing. So Sue's showed some of the data from our long-term N rundown experiment, and interestingly, over nine years, the treatment without any added N has achieved an average of 5.4 tonnes of dry matter per year. At 200 units of N fertiliser, year in, year out, the average is 10 tonne. So that's setting the scene for us about where we're going and what we're trying to achieve if we want a legume in the system. So what are the roles of legumes in a system? What are they there for? We want them to grow dry matter, that's no doubt. We want them to fix nitrogen, so they have to be functional. We want some of that nitrogen to cycle back into the mixed sward. We want to increase, obviously, the, the livestock quality, uh, the intake for the livestock, so they're getting a better, better ration and a better diet to drive the animal performance. Maybe, depending on the legume, we can extend that growing season from October to May. Maybe we can fatten that out a little bit 
but we need them to be persistent and resilient so that we don't have to come back and re-sow them every other year. The thing to remember is that no matter what legume we're trying to grow in the system, this, this sort of number, that 20 to 25 kilograms of N fixed per tonne of dry matter, that's, that's the threshold, that's the upper threshold. While the legume may fix that amount of nitrogen in a tonne, the actual availability of the nitrogen is probably around 13 kilograms of N goes back into the system per tonne of legume dry matter produced. So by our calculations, if we're aiming for this 50 units to 100 units of N uh, per hectare per year, that's suggesting we need to grow somewhere in the order of four to eight tonne of legume dry matter every year if we can. That's a substantial target. <laughs> Let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> um, so that's, that's the bounds of what we're working with. And Andrew's already asked some questions about um, nitrogen and burning roots and whatever, whatever. Nitrogen in a grazed pasture system is an incredibly complex beast. <laughs> there is a mass balance diagram that David Herridge put together in 2004 to describe where the mass of N sits in a grazed system. Nitrogen is slippery. That's a phrase that Graham Schwanke likes to use. It's a difficult thing to track down. It's a difficult thing to work with. But there are some, there are some broad guidelines. So Harry et al compiled data from around the world which showed there's this sort of minimum threshold of 15 kilograms of N fixed per tonne of dry matter and there is an upper threshold of around 25 kilograms of N fixed per tonne of dry matter. No matter where you are in the world or what you're growing, everything pretty much falls into that nice little wedge. There's a slight favouritism for the warm season legumes to, get, to fix a little bit more and a little bit less for the cool season legumes. But if we can take a snapshot out of that, David's mass balance of nitrogen, he was suggesting that from three tonnes of legume dry matter produced per hectare, perhaps 55 kilograms of soil nitrate N makes its way back into the pasture system. It's a difficult thing to achieve. So what pathways are we talking about for N to make its way back into our tropical, tropical pasture sward? Nitrogen's tricky. There's uh, Wedden and Roussel nicely described the main pathways that nitrogen moves around a mixed sward under grazing. The first six, uh, the first four, sorry, they're recognised but they're the minor pathways for the nitrogen to move around. The major pathways that are of interest to us are in the red box. So movement of N from the legume herbage itself via leaching and or decomposition of trash and litter in the soil surface, getting that back into the leaching into the soil. And also very importantly, the redeposition of N from the nitrogen that the livestock consume. Now in a grazing system, number six is incredibly important. So for, for us thinking about, okay, legumes in tropical grasses, how do we achieve it? How do we achieve a minimum of four tonne legume grown year in, year out, in order to maintain the productivity and persistence and performance of the tropical grass sward? Well, we've had a go. <clears throat> so after that context and that introduction to try and get everyone in the same headspace as myself, and if you guys have got some further gems to add in regard to that, please, please let us know. So what have we done? We've got some choices. We've got a warm season group of legumes and we've got a cool season group of legumes. We've got annuals and perennials. Uh, in terms of the tropical annuals, I've put a bit of a line through those. We haven't had much success there, so we won't go there at all. 
Um, but this is what we've been working on and what we're currently working with. So let's run through now the work that we've done over the last 15 or so years. The first, <clears throat> the first attempt to get legumes into a tropical grass was under the Evergrays program. <clears throat> Excuse me for the frog. And Northwest Slopes, New England, Subclover, it was our first go-to. So, okay, fine. Let's try sub uh, Dal... I always get that tongue tangled up. Let's try Dalkeith Subclover. A bit of a stalwart for this region. And you'll notice that on the graphs that I'm going to present, there's a four-ton red line. So, I'm using that four-ton as the benchmark. Do we meet the benchmark or not? Dalkeith subclover, 2009 to 2012, we averaged a bit over 1,500 kilograms. Scratch. Didn't do the job. Venus Lucen averaged over 8 tonne in the mixture with digit grass. Big tick. That's the upper end of the threshold we're looking for. Why did the subclover not perform? Our, my interpretation of the soil water data is, well, we're trying to get these temperate annual legumes to germinate and grow at the absolute driest time of the year. How many wet winters have we had since the year 2000? One, two, one. So it's really difficult to get those traditional temperate annual legumes to, to grow and germinate in a tropical grass sward that will literally suck the profile dry by March move on. There are other temperate annual legumes and Suze has done some nice evaluation work trying to see what falls out of the mix here. This site was uh, near Manila and the ones that met around the four tonne and survived and persisted and regenerated, barrel medic, snail medic, woolly pod vetch, the ones that were close to the mark, arrow leaf clover, purple clover, um, bladder, gland, so I'd be interested to hear the experience from your producers as to what they're seeing that works for the different soil types. So wherever you are, the soil type is always going to be important for the choice of the temperate annual legume. So while those ones got the red tick of approval, what did it look like in terms of the benchmark? On the far left-hand side is digit grass fertilised with N on this site the years 2014 to 2016. So even fertilised digit grass on this soil only achieved around four and a half tonne of dry matter per year. And look at the contributions made by the legumes to total production. So the, the barrel medics, they exceeded the four tonne. Uh, the, the snails, the woolly pod vetches, they were, they were close to it. So yeah, that's, that's looking promising. Our temperate Perennial legume, Mr. Favourite, Lucen. An experiment that we ran here um, in, under the, a range of projects with Evergrays and the, the CRC was to look at the influence of the Lucen winter activity rating. So IE does a more active type favour the system better than a less active type. Also to look at, well, how do we, what configuration do we sow the pasture at? So the three photographs are the combinations. On the left was alternate rows, one to one. The middle photo was three rows of digit, three rows of lucen. The photo on the right is six rows of digit, six rows of lucen. So over a number of years, we, we measured, cut and diced this experiment and what we achieved was around a 12 tonne average dry matter per hectare per year um, for the ones on the left, so the one to one and three to three. But what we saw was the loosened component, even though the sowing rates were proportionally 50-50, just in different configurations, the loosened dominated the swords nearly to the tune of 70% of dry matter. Water use efficiency on those systems was running at around 20, and in terms of yield, et cetera, the highly active types exceeded the 
semi-dormant, exceeding the, the dormant. In terms of the four seasons, it's nice to look at these, this sequence of photographs. The top left is spring, so you can see that the, there's a, the odd flower here on the lucerne already, whereas the digit grass is only really just starting to wake up. In a good early summer, both species are happy, green and lush. By the time we get to late summer, early autumn, the system's run out of water. In winter, the only thing that's providing a trickle of green is the lucerne, as you would expect. My message here is that because lucerne begins its water uptake and its growth earlier in the season, it leads to the domination of the sward. By way of comparison, how did we go with our benchmark? On the left-hand side is the one-to-one -one group and the right-hand side is the six-to-six. -six. So I've compiled the data by the three lucent cultivars compared with the digit grass fertilised in terms of production. So you can see that lucent wasn't a problem. We exceeded the four tonne, averaged more than eight tonne in, on the one-to-one -one treatments, but over here, when the species were separated more, total production declined. So neither was the lucin happy and neither was the digit happy because the digit couldn't access as much nitri nitrogen and or water, presumably. Um, but the lucin did not grow as well either because it had to compete against itself. <clears throat> so yeah, lucin looks like a favourable legume in this system, but it leads to this domination of the sward. So too much lucent. So that led us on to tropical legumes. So now thinking about the grass growing in the same season as the legume, or the legume growing in the same season as the grass. So rather than competing, um, getting an early jump start in the lucent sort of situation, let's try to grow these species together, same season, give them an equal opportunity to, to grow and access the resource. So in this body of work, we used Leucina and Desmanthus as our tropical legumes, but also had Lucin cultivar Venus in there as well. Now, it's interesting if you look across that particular photograph, which is pretty much the whole experimental site, I just want to point out, see the colour of that block of digit and this block of digit and that block of digit compared with that block of digit. That block of digit is fertilised with nitrogen. This block of digit, mm, well, it's trying to eke out some nitrogen from the leucina. This mixture here is desmanthus and digit. Doesn't have the same appearance as the fertilised end. Hmm, interesting. Help or hindrance. So what did it look like over the duration of the experiment? In this environment, Leucina, we struggled to get to two tonne of dry matter over the average. Desmanthus also struggled to get to two tonne on average. But again, Lucin, Venus, dominated the swords and achieved nearly our eight tonne. So I hope you're picking up a bit of a, a consistency here in what I'm saying. So neither of these tropical legume systems worked for us to a standard that we would say is acceptable. Desmanthus started out extremely well. In our first year, um, in our establishment year, there's Mark, Mark Brennan, standing next to Mark Desmanthus, and it was magnificent. We thought, this is great. However, by the end of year, two, I think it was halfway towards the end of year two, we started to see this discoloration, this yellowing appear in the desmanthus, and we went, oh, what's that? Alfalfa mosaic virus in this environment is common because there's a background of lucin in this environment. Um, aphids did their job, spread the AMV to the desmanthus, and, well, Bob's my father, not my uncle. And, oops, sorry. Um, so yeah, Desmanthus looked highly promising, still is looking highly promising, but this caveat of alfalfa, alfalfa mosaic virus on Vegardus is a problem. But this here 
is the attractive thing. Desmanthus will set seed, well managed, and readily recruits. So that is the little carrot for us with Desmanthus. Lucent doesn't do a good job of replicating itself in a mixed ward, but Desmanthus can. So in this environment, Desmanthus is a short-lived perennial, um, but readily recruits. So that's the attraction for that species. Having that experiment run where we had these different legumes in the same paddock, um, intensively monitored for soil water content, what it enabled me to do was tease out, well, which species is accessing water when? Because the species that accesses water first is going to dominate the sward. So I've got four species here, lucin, digit grass, desmanthus and leucina. And what you're looking at is actually the, the rate of change of profile soil water content in terms of millimetres per day. So each day, the pasture is using water, it will extract water. So how many millimetres per day is it taking out of the system? Conversely, if um, we're in the non-growing season, we're accumulating. The soil water is building. So the span of the graph is from the start of the growing season, just in August, you see the tail end of the accumulation, through the whole growing season to nearly May. Now I'll just step through this so that we can tease out what I'm talking about. So loosen at the top. Loosen's peak extraction rate of nearly two and a half, three millimetres per day occurred in mid-October. Digit. Digit grass's peak extraction rate of a bit over two millimetres per day occurred in early November. Desmanthus, peak extraction rate of around three millimetres per day occurred in late November, early December. And Leukina, lastly, its peak extraction rate of over two millimetres a day occurred in January. So just let that sink in for a minute. If Lucin is taking water out of the system in early October and you're growing it with digit grass, well, Lucin's going to win the race. If you're growing a mixture with digit grass and desmanthus, well, digit grass is going to access the water before the desmanthus. So the desmanthus is going to be compromised. If it's digit and leukina, the situation's even worse because the leukina has to recover from frosting in this environment. It doesn't generate a canopy. It's got to regenerate its canopy. So by the time it's actively growing, oh, sorry, digit grass has already outcompeted it. So that picture of how water might, might work in these systems, I think, is an important piece of information to inform the agronomy of how these work. So that brings us to what are we doing now? I hope it does. Yeah. So the two experiments that we've got currently in the ground that I now want to run through is, well, I've shown that time after time after time, whenever we've grown loosen with digit grass, it leads us to having a loosen pasture. Loosen out, wins the race and outcompetes the digit. So the first body of work I'll look at is trying to figure out what is the optimum proportion of lucin in a digit grass mixture. The second experiment that we're working on at the moment is, well, if you've got a digit grass, uh, sorry, if you've got a tropical grass pasture that has no legume in it, it was either established as a pure sward or it's a sward that's lost its legume content, how do you get the legume back into it? It's not as simple as it sounds. So I'll run through those. What is the optimum proportion of lucin in a digit grass pasture? 
Suze showed a little slide there where we thought that the optimum density of digit grass plants in a sward in this environment is in that order of four to nine plants per square metre at establishment. So we've designed an experiment that is fixed at eight plants per square metre, individually planted, the boys with crowbars, that was a large day, planting individual plants of digit grass and individual plants of lucerne cultivar venus. And what we have is five treatments, starting from the left, of all digit grass or lucerne 0%, 25% loosen, 50% loosen, 75% loosen, and 100% loosen. So that spectrum of combinations hopefully allows us to tease out the, the timing of the water use and the growth, what sort of interactions are occurring between the grass and the legume, when does the nitrogen become available to the grass in the mixture, uh, and also in the last summer, it's given us an opportunity to take some measurements to try and quantify the NFIX via N15 uptake. So, what does it look like? The experiment's been running since 2018, same style of graph. What we see, our benchmark, loosen at 25% in this sward is averaging a bit over two tonne of dry matter. Loosen at 50% is smack on the four, four tonne of dry matter. Loosen at 75%, well, not much better than the loosen at 50, which is interesting because the relative difference in legume proportion here, you're talking another 50% a greater. 50% more loosened plants, yet achieved no more legume dry matter. And at eight plants per square metre, our loosen has averaged just a tick under six tonne of dry matter. The bar on the left is digit grass fertilised with nitrogen, more than eight tonne of dry matter on average. So that gives you a picture of the, the types of uh, what the treatments look like. But I thought I would run through with you um, an example of how the different proportions function uh, when we receive a good rainfall event. The experiment was established in 2018. So this panel is total stored soil water down to a depth of 1.9 metres measured with the neutron probe uh, via access tubes. So each trace is the total amount of water in the profile for the treatments. First thing I want to draw your attention to is at the peak of the drought, Lucen had the wettest profile. Is that what you're expecting? 100% um, 100, 100 digit grass, so our L0, had the driest profile. Interesting. But what I want to work through is what happened from this peak of the drought in that first major rainfall event. Sue's showed some data from the other experiments elsewhere in the paddock. So it's exactly the same period of time. For this period, uh, I recorded 237 millimetres of rain within the timings of my measurements. So from the 9th of January to the 20th of February, 237 millimetres of rain. These graphs show the drained upper limit for the soil and the red line is the crop or pasture lower limit for digit grass there and the crop or pasture lower limit for lucerne over here. From this rainfall event what we documented was the digit grass pasture accumulated 144 millimetres of extra stored soil water out of that 237 millimetres of rain. Our L100 only increased by 36 millimetres out of that 237 millimetres of rain. So that's just setting up for you something was going on. They're not the same. So what did that translate in terms of production? 
So for that period of time, it was a, just under six weeks, I think, uh, the treatments soon after the rain. It wasn't, wasn't, um, wasn't the day after the rain, obviously. It was maybe two or three days, four days after the rain. That's what the, the pasture treatments looked like, ranging from digit grass on the left through to loosen 100% on the right. Now you can quickly see there's a problem here in terms of ground cover. So our eight plants per square metre for a loosened stand, ground cover was probably in the order of 20 to 40%. And you can see a sliding cascade uh, across the treatments in terms of ground cover slipping down. We can see our rainfall capture slipping down and our total dry matter produced over that six weeks for L0 and L25, around four tonnes of dry matter in that six weeks. In terms of water use efficiency, somewhere around the 40 odd mark. But for poor old loose and dominated pasture over here, quite low. So that just shows you there's an interaction. There's interactions that are going to occur in these mixed swards, not only from the nitrogen point of view, but also from the water point of view. The last, the last area of um, work I want to run over is now getting legumes back into these pastures. How do we go about doing it? <sighs> Tricky. So out at Atunga, we've set up an um, experiment on John and Laurie Chaffee's place where we have an existing tropical grass pasture, a mix of digit grass, bambatsi, the odd panic. And we're targeting two groups of legumes, our temperate annual legumes or our summer growing tropical legumes. So what we've set up <clears throat> is a series of treatments for targeting a sowing window for our temperate legumes. Our sowing window is in May but for our tropical legumes, our sowing window is in November. So we go back 16 weeks for our first treatment. So for our first treatment, we're gonna spray strips out of this pasture for 16 weeks to accumulate soil water in order to give us something to sow into in the sowing window. So for our temperate legumes, that's, that preparation window commenced in early January, but for our tropical legumes, our preparation window started in July, mid-July. The second treatment is eight weeks out from point of sowing. So we've got a 16 week preparation window, an eight week preparation window and point of sowing. In terms of getting the temperate legumes into this tropical grass, there's a photograph there showing you what I mean by the three metre wide strip sprayed out of the existing pasture. And that spray strip was either maintained for 16 weeks, eight weeks, or on the day of sowing, it was sprayed out. A collection of data sets that we're trying to, we're collecting, trying to describe what's happening in terms of these processes. The first one, the first panel up the top, is what sort of increase in stored soil water are we achieving in the 16 week, the eight week and the zero week treatment? And that boomerang shape is across that sowing strip. So the left-hand side of the boomerang is in the tropical grass. The peak of the boomerang is smack bang in the middle of the, the spray strip. And the right-hand side of the boomerang is back into the existing pasture. So the top panel is showing, well, did we, did we increase soil water content by having these spray fallows over those different durations? And the answer is yes, for the 16 week, so this is starting in January, remember? 16 weeks sprayed out from January. Yes, we achieved a, a substantial amount increase in water content in the center of that strip. However, what we also achieved was a decline in ground cover. 
And Sue's has already pointed, ground cover is important when we're establishing things. So unfortunately, our 16 week treatment achieved the greatest decline in ground cover. Our zero week, obviously, is just straight across, no change. Add those two things together and you get that, weed burden. So soon after we sowed and we came back to assess emergence, we went, oh, we've got a lot of weeds to deal with here, so we better have a bit of a count and see what we've got. So for the 16-week treatment, which had more soil water and a decline in ground cover, what we successfully did was achieved more weeds in with our legume that we now need to manage. <laughs> Old cropping country, flea bane, wireweed, all those lovely species. Um, yeah, they were as thick as our legumes. So anyway, that's just an interesting interaction, what you start doing when you disturb the system. In terms of germination, yeah, we got some great results. So you can see that in terms of seedling density, the dark blue again is the 16 week and the boomerang shape is from the edge of the sowing strip through to the middle and through to the far edge of the sowing strip. So you can see there's a bit of a hump in the middle where soil water content was highest. We got the, the best seedling density. The two photos there just show woolly pod vetch in the center of the sowing strip versus on the edge of the sowing strip next to the existing pasture. All competition stuff. So what did we achieve over the whole growing season? So the three groups here, I've now grouped the 16 week treatment, the eight week treatment and the zero week treatment together. And the blue bars are our Venus uh, Lucen, our Haymaker Woolly Pod Vetch and Calif Barrel Medic. What stands out for you in terms of the four ton? Nothing, didn't get there. But what you can see is particularly for the woolly pod vetch, the woolly pod vetch peak dry matter on the 16 week treatment cascading down to the zero week. The loosen, slightly different. Now remember I said there was this interaction with cover. Less cover over here, more weeds, so it was in fact the eight week treatment that gave us our peak for lucin production. For our medics, unfortunately, in terms of uh, peak dry matter, not a lot, but they did set seed and put seed back into the system. The last thing I wanna draw your attention to is this green bar on the right. That's the existing tropical grass that was in the sprayed out strips. So remember our first treatment, spraying out from January. Species should be active. We're hitting it with Roundup every other week to make sure it's not doing anything. Our eight week treatment, starting to hit it in that March, April time, and or at the point of sowing, spray it at zero week. So what we clearly did there was, well, we knocked out the tropical grass in our 16 week treatment, but well, we pretty much maintained it at the, when we sprayed it out on the day of sowing. So that's starting to think about, well, we don't want to nuke the tropical grass altogether. We do want to retain it um, for future purpose. So what about now getting tropical legumes into this same pasture? So for our tropical legumes, the same structure of experiment, we've got our three metre wide spray strips, um, eight weeks in the foreground, zero week in the middle, 16 week block there, some more zero weeks in the back. What did we do in terms of increasing stored soil water by operating those, those fallow lengths? Now, we're operating this in the cool season, leading into a spring, early summer sowing. So the dynamic is different. So in this situation, our 16 week and our eight week spray fallows were virtually identical. That gives me a clue. That gives me a clue that, well, we don't have to spray the pasture out for 16 weeks here. We can spray it out for eight weeks and still get the same result. Again, ground cover. Where we take it out for longer, we lose more ground cover. 
what did we achieve in terms of seedlings? Yeah, not too bad. Same structure of, of graphs. So from the edge of the sowing row to the middle to the outside. So for Lucin, Desmanthus cultivar Mark and Desmanthus cultivar JCU2. So what we see, that same hump effect, more seedlings in the middle of the sowing band, less on the edges. Broadly speaking, yeah, the 16 week treatment had slightly more Desmanthus. Mm, but interesting, the Lucin, we had as many seedlings on the Lucin treatment whether we'd spray it out for 16 weeks or whether we sprayed it out on the day of sowing. <laughs> so that's intriguing. Think about that one. So the, you know, this was looking great. We had some nice germination. We had some great looking little seedlings there. We thought this is easy. This is, this is going really well. Then came the wet summer. You know the summer we've just had. So we come out of this busting drought. We're trying to accumulate soil water in order to establish these things. Then we got lots of rain. The pasture looked like that in January. And we thought, this is too easy. This is fantastic. We, we finally cracked this nut. And then we went back at the end of the season and measured what we had. What stands out for you on that graph, on that bar chart? <laughs> Help or hindrance. Um, that's, why, that's why I put those words on the title slide. Okay, so we had really good seedling counts. We had good emergence. Things were looking great. We had one of the wettest summers that anyone can remember since the 1950s. Yet, we struggled to get Desmanthus to look much better than this and poor old Lucent to look much better than that in among this competitive beast that is tropical grass. Where we sprayed the tropical grass out for 16 weeks leading into spring. We made it angry, we gave it water, we mineralized nitrogen and it said thank you and generated over seven tonne of dry matter. And you can see the sliding scale. So even where we, we sprayed out in November at the point of sowing, we still achieved four tonne of dry matter. So on the 16 week one, we effectively cleaned up all the winter trash, got that out of the system, stopped it using water, but lost ground cover. Um, the tropical grass was dormant, so it didn't really matter how many times we sprayed it with Roundup, we weren't gonna kill it. We knocked out a few, but not very many. Uh, it bounced back nicely. Is this the sort of finish, and then we'll go to questions? Otherwise, it's just... I think I'm virtually there. So I guess what I've, I'm trying to show you is, no, we don't have all the answers at all. And I'm sure there is a bunch of collective wisdom and knowledge from the producers you've worked with that has as much um, information to share is what we have generated within experimental context. And obviously, as Sue said, none of this happens without a lot of support and the technical guys that help us out on this, uh, first and foremost, um, none of our experiments would look much of a success without their diligence and commitment to maintaining the treatments and of course, all our, our funding partners. For a, for a lighter soil, I have the analogy of uh, you know, easy in, easy out in terms of the rainfall. So on a lighter soil, you're going to get a much better response um, for the temperate legumes on a smaller fall of rain. I have not modelled the legume side of it, but I have modelled the tropical grass establishment. And yes, there is quite a substantial difference on those lighter soils and or with environments that have a little bit more consistent rainfall where establishment becomes a little bit easier. I would imagine it's the same story with the, with the temperate annual legumes. Um, the more I've thought about this, uh, you know, my, my starting of work in the Northwest was in the SGS program in the late 1990s. And that was an experiment where we had decent sized paddocks with animals doing their thing. We, we, we had very, very good results from the Southern Super program there in that system. 
but for the tropicals, we haven't been able to replicate it. But most of what we've done with tropicals has been in the absence of animals. The animals know what they need, and that, that will change, I guess, as they work their way into the sward. That dynamic of managing the livestock and the grass and the legume component, yeah, what do you do? For us, in our experiments, we have tended to manage for the persistence of the loosen. So that's why we're sort of leaning towards that six week grazing rotation. Because within our experiments, we want to keep the loosen there. So we're managing, we're favoring it in terms of our management on our experiments. And that is different to what's going to happen out on a commercial property. So yeah, I think there's a gap. There is a gap there between what we can achieve in a experimental context where we're trying to limit the variation to tease out the treatment effect versus what producers are doing commercially and having success. Even though we've still got a bulk of uh, dry grass material here, the loosen, if it's loosen, is being hammered, you've got you've to pull them out. Otherwise, you lose your loosen, then you'll be trying to re-establish it sooner rather than later. Some people might want to really pump a pure sward and, and time their nitrogen application with their water availability and, and get the best out of it, get their peak growth rate, mob stock the animals on there, keep it down in that two, two, four leaf stage, happy days. Other people might not. So yeah. So some of the early work that was done by Phil Tao from UNE in the if I get the year right, I think it was in the 1970s, early 70s. I could be wrong. Um, he was growing lucin and premier digit grass mixtures up near Inverell somewhere. And he was fertilizing them plus N back then. And I'm not talking small amounts of N, I'm talking large amounts of N. He was, if I, if I remember correctly, total N application to that mixed sward his top end treatment was like 800 units of N. <laughs> Any of these mixed swords, you, you want the, the legume to derive its nitrogen supply, at least 70% of its nitrogen supply from atmosphere. If it's got easy pickings out of the soil nitrate pool, that's where it'll get it from. 